Hello, everybody. We are back with another episode of Bets, Birds, Golf over here, and we are doing a little impromptu host session on my behalf, as John Dager will be most likely joining us shortly. He's just running a little overdue on another obligation. But until then, we will do it as always, like we have in the past, the good old duo called the Ron and Byron Show, the Byron Show, and my good good friend, aka PJ Splits, aka Ron, the whole shebang. How are you doing today, my buddy? I'm um, chilly. Um, since moving from Texas, I can't believe this weather. You know, it's May and it's like snowing a couple nights ago. And so just trying to warm up up here in good old pure Michigan. But um, yeah, we got another, um, what is this, the eighth elevated event of the year. So mm -hmm. I love this course. Uh, it's kind of a wide open field with no ROM or Scheffler, which is, you know, it's good and it's bad. You always like to have those guys playing, everybody together. But um, it kind of opens it up for maybe maybe another Kurt Kitayama, Kitayama type to, to sneak in. So we'll see. Um, yeah, the last few weeks have been pretty good. You know, the model has had some good success. Yep. I think last week in Mexico, eight of the top 13 on the leaderboard were in the top 18 of the model last week. So again, uh, subscribers get access to that full model every week. And I try to kind of put every relevant metric and, you know, a lot of unique splits, like for this week, for example, um, we got strokes gained on, you know, difficult scoring conditions. Quail Hollow obviously is a long course, so we look at you know how players perform on other long courses. So, um, uh, really excited to get into this week. Yeah, well, tell the people what's going on at Betsbirds over there. Um, we've got that model that's showing up, and we've got some really cool thing. I love the carry distance. I think that's going to really be important at the PGA, where it's all going to be a little wetter, and you know rollout's going to be minimized. So, tell the people how that's been going for us so far, and you know where they can get it, and what kind of promos we're running right now. Yeah, even this week, you know, at, at Quail Hollow, they've had a lot of rain in Charlotte recently. So, you know, we have um, in our database, uh, straight from the PGA Tour, um, you know, carry distance. We have um, all sorts of off the team metrics that really nobody else has. Um, even going into approach, you know, we have two drivable par fours this week. Um, and so, you know, players, a lot of players will be going for the green off the tee. And so, we have all those going for the green stats and it kind of, it's, it's really cool because it shows how aggressive players are. Um, just looks at what percentage of the time they actually go for the green. And then also, you know, we kind of get into how much success do they have? What's their birdie or better percentage? How many times do they actually hit the green when they go for it? Um, and then just going down the line, everything from, we have scrambling on short grass, you know, a lot of players struggle when lies are really tight. And so you can kind of see, you know, scrambling on rough or short grass, um, just a lot of little neat things that, um, you know, are pretty unique to our site. And uh, so, yeah, that's right there on bestbirdsgolf.com. Um, again, you can get a uh, for as low as $20 a month uh, to subscribe. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're going to be making it better and uh, continuing to add to it as we go. Um, but, yeah, of course, we have all the content every week, yeah. um, articles, database stuff. So, uh, yeah, great time to join uh, Bestbirds Golf. Absolutely. No, that's, I totally agree on that. That model is pretty cool. I love, I love using it and it's really intriguing to see how you can use the different filters that you guys have there that aren't necessarily available everywhere else. So that's really, really cool there. Um, speaking of models and things like that, Ron, what kind of, I'll run through some things that I'm kind of th leaning on this week. I think the blueprint is pretty obvious. Distance off the tee, good approach play from 100 yards, 150 yards and out. And then, you know, you need to be able to scramble around you and then avoid the three putts. Um, good putting from five to 15 feet on Bermuda grass. And that's pretty much my situation that I've, those are the, like the four or five key components of my model this week. And I think that's going to happen with a lot of other people. So there are going to be, have to be some DFS players that are going to be contrarian, you know, going to have to find some, some weird dudes that don't have a lot of distance off the tee. But I think that's the general blueprint when you're looking for, you know, we, we can, you, you can expect to play the best this week, you know, a hundred times out of a hundred kind of thing. Any other any other additions to that that you you may think? Yeah, it's 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 real similar this week to Mexico last week. You know, obviously yep. um, that course last week is is much easier than the one here, much more of a resort style setup. Um, so yeah, like you said here, it's it's bombers, it's long iron players. You know, 175 plus yards. I think 55 percent of approaches are from at least 175. Yep. Um, biggest difference here is it's just way harder to gain strokes um, on approach. Um, so I think. Um, you know, you're looking at a, a greens and regulation percentage of only 60%. And so um, scrambling is going to come much more into play here. Now, it's not necessarily a lot more difficult here compared to the tour average. It's just you're going to have a lot more attempts at scrambling and around the green play. So 
Um, a big reason of that is just these greens are some of the toughest on tour. You know, they're undulated. Um, they start off at around a 12 on the stint meter, but throughout the week, um, they usually bump them to up to a 13. And so they're going to be running fast by Sunday. Of course, they have the spare system below these greens. So even if it's wet, um, they can pump all that water out and they can kind of make them as firm as they want to, which usually kind of happens every year. So that's just kind of the basics behind why, you know, approach play is so tough here. And, um, you know, putting, you know, we'll get into that. But, um, you know, we've seen guys um, pretty much have really good weeks putting here, you know, and, and even guys who aren't typically great putters. Um, so it's just all about um, kind of balancing all that together. But for the most part, you're going to have to be good in every part of your bag to uh, have success here. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, there's a reason why these these venues, this venue hosts President's Cups, Ryder Cups, you know, um, PGA Championships, things like that. It's a very prestigious event um, or resort area, not resort, place. Let's just go with that. And yeah, it's really interesting. I think, you know, the it's one of the few 7,500-yard par 71s out there. So it's not like you can see this everywhere else. And I think it's, it's really going to, from a betting perspective, you can just do exactly what we've been talking about. From a DFS perspective, I think we're going to have to get a little different. And you will see there are people that the chalk is accumulating around. We fit these boxes pretty perfectly. So um, we can get into them here shortly. So should we start with the 10K range and go down from there? There's only four guys in this range, um, starting with the the OG of Quail Hollow, Rory McIlroy at 11100 bucks. We've got Xander, kind of out of nowhere at $10,700. And then Patrick Candy and Tony Fina at ten five ten two to round out the bottom here. To me, Xander seems like he's a fish out of water in this price range, which makes me kind of like him. Um, I do actually like his game around this venue. I'll be upfront with you and say I will be playing Cam Young this week in DFS because I really like him a lot. And therefore, I will be out on Rory this week. As always, fading the top chalk, dude. That's just, I love to get hurt that way. Um, Roy's putt has been a bit too, too much of a concern for me lately. I'm not entirely thrilled about that. I do love what Xander's getting up to everywhere else apart from off the tee. He's one of, I was looking at the, the splits for him and, and Cantley when, when we were getting into that for the Zurich and my, oh my, I did not realize how good of a long iron player Xander Shafley actually is. He's elite. Like he's one of the top five best in the world when it comes to that. And just looking at all of his metrics, like from 200 yards out, from 150 to 200, he's third, fourth, and second, you know, just ridiculously good approach metrics there. So I love what he can get up to there. Um, the off the tee stuff, I think, might be slightly nullified here a little bit, Ron. What do you think about that? Um, that's his biggest weakness in his game. And I think he's still got the distance to make up for that here. He's not elite in distance, but he's got enough of it um, for his inaccuracies to still kind of you know, get away with that a little bit. That's the only area of his game I'm really concerned about. So really like Xander. Who, who are you really liking in this range and and who are you fading? So this this top of the board here where you go from, you know, Rory down to, to Fino at 10-2 is, is really tough for me this week. Um, and again, I'll probably kind of stick with my same strategy, which which has been working pretty well um, recently. And then that's, you know, kind of playing everybody up here and, and taking some firmer stands down low in the, you know, the 7 and 8K range. Um, I'll just start off with Xander because surprisingly to me, he finished number one in my model for the week. Um, and like you said, with wow. him being at 10, seven, you know, people are, you know, we're, we're kind of used to him being, you know, kind of in that nine K range. And so I think he is a little bit overpriced. Um, but you know, related to what you said off the tee, um, he has struggled somewhat more than other years. He has admitted much in his press conference uh, yesterday. Um, but I think overall, um, he kind of talked about how he fixed his problems at the Zurich at the Zurich with um, when he was partnered with Cantley. And so, you know, I think looking at his, just the big picture here, he really excels on long courses. Um, he also plays a draw, which I've read a lot of comments that quail hollow kind of favors a draw off the tee. Um, so favors his shot shape. Like you said, he's a top five long iron player in the world um, and just has that all around game. That's going to fit at a tough course like quail hollow. So, yeah, I'm going to be playing a lot of Xander. Um, when you just go up to Rory, like the course history here is just beyond what like right. most other players have, like nine straight top 16s here, eight top 10s. Um, <laughs> when you look at the stats that you and I both discussed at the beginning, you know, when you when you combine distance and a long iron proximity, 
you know, he's number one. And so, you know, I, I almost think even at 21% or whatever he's going at, um, you know, for me, I'm going to have some parts of Rory in there, whether I'm field average or whether I'm, you know, go twice weight. Um, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, and then Cantlay, you know, he's getting a lot of talk this week, similar to Shoffley. Like he's just good at everything. And, you know, he's kind of been way above his normal baseline trend, you know, over the last, you know, couple months or so. And so it's like he's peaking. And then you've got Tony who just won last week. And, you know, from all accounts, uh, his coach said he's about to go on a big run here. And so, you know, he just looks so good all around. And so, you know, for me, I'm going to, I'm going to have bits and pieces of each of these guys, but uh, definitely Xander is one on my list this week. Yeah. I'm seeing uh, Rory come in at around about 30% run, which to me is a, it's a hefty number, but it's warranted. He's number one in my model. Um, I'm really curious as to what kind of got Xander ahead of him for you. Um, but there's a lot to like about Rory outside of the fact that he's got a bad putter coming into the week and he's going to be a third of the field, you know, rostered. So to me, if I want to play, I don't think it's looking like Cam Young, Victor Hovland and Rory are the three big chalky, chalky guys this week in each different range, which is kind of crazy, but also makes logical sense. But I think if I'm going to be playing a lot of Cam, Rory's going to be a casualty of that decision. And I think that's just how it's going to be for me. I'll take my chances. Hopefully the putter still continues to just absolutely suck, you know, because that's been his biggest issue lately. And switching back to it, we're not sure if that's even going to really help or not. I don't know. Is the time off worth worth it? Who knows? You know, there's a lot of negative press around him right now. I don't know. I'm trying to convince myself that it's a good decision. It's nervy, but I think he also frees up a lot of salary if you kind of go away from an 11-1 Rory, you know, especially with, with the field that we have and, the, the, the studs that we have in these other ranges. So you can't go wrong with Tony or Patrick either. You know, I think you just got to either do your, your strategy and just do all four guys and kind of sprinkle them in or kind of just really hone in on one or two of them and kind of roster them a lot. So I do like those two approaches. Moving on to the 9K range where I think we can really start differentiating ourselves and, and really they might, there's, there's going to be lots of builds that start with these guys. Um, especially with, you know, Victor being in this range at 9-2. I think he's looking at around about 27% ownership for me right now, which is one of the highest in this range. I don't think any other guy is particularly close to him, which is also fine by me. I'll be fading Victor. <laughs> I don't know why I keep fading these chalky dudes. Victor rated out at 14th in my model for me. I don't necessarily appreciate he's around the green play this week. Um, the putter can get hot and cold. So if there's a I've always mentioned, like, if there's a definite flaw in a person's game and he's Chalk City, I'm out. You know, I'll 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 be okay getting out of there. Um, I prefer people like Sung J M, Jason Day, Mass Fitzpatrick around him there for my pivots, and I think you can get away with almost playing one or two of them for the same ownership as a Victor this week. So, thoughts on the nine K range, Ryan? So I really want to play Jordan Spieth so bad. And then I, you know, I don't know what you have him at. I got him coming in as high as 17, 18% right now. What do you, what do you have him at? Yeah, I got him at 17. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, just his recent play has just been tremendous. Um, and, you know, of course he was so good here at the president's cup. So, mm -hmm. you know, you like to think that, Oh, maybe this course is too long for him, but he's gained off the tee with distance wise. And, you know, I don't think you can play into that anymore. Um, I guess for me, kind of dropping down to these next two below Spieth is, you know, I cannot believe Max Homa and his ownership percentage is kind of, you know, 12, 13 percent on that range. Um, you know, he's got elite history, not only here. Of course, he picked up his first ever career win here in 2019. But, you know, similar courses, you know, he won at Riv. Um, he just always seems to play well in these kind of driver heavy classical type courses. Um, of course, he also um, very good at the president's cup here has had his struggles, which I'm sure that's the reason for the ownership kind of being down. Um, but again, at his press conference yesterday, you know, he said, Hey, I'm back on track. I've had a lot of time off to work on stuff. Um, his numbers were better at the Zurich with, um, you know, more power, even though they didn't make the cut. Um, so his off the tee game was good. Um, so I just think at 9,400 at that ownership, um, you know, everybody was so high on him just a month ago. Um, and so, you know, you got Rahm and Scheffler not here. I think, I think it's another great opportunity for Homa to, to, to perhaps win this again. So, and then just right below him, you know, Matt Fitzpatrick, another guy who's not getting much love. Um, you know, everybody knows how much he's gained off the tee distance wise. So again, that fits here. 
one of the best scramblers um, on courses with, you know, difficult greens and regulation rates, top 10 putter in the field. And again, he had those injury concerns, but he's got three straight top 20s, of course, just one at the Heritage. So I think Fitzpatrick is a really great fit, you know, and, you know, the narrative always around him is, you know, he plays really well on a tough course as well. Quail Hollow is one of the toughest they're going to see all year. Um, so, yeah, Hovland, you said a lot of good things about him. Um, yeah, that that chalk is getting up there. And just the fact that Victor hasn't hasn't won one of these events when you have a field this strong, you know, that might be enough for me right now to kind of take me off him. But then you look at the other side and you just the consistency is just so great, like 15 straight made cuts. You know, he's the second best ball striker in this field. Like you said, around the green play is coming into play a lot more this weekend. You know, it's important, but it's not really tough around the green here. So that's another thing to think about um, when, when, when playing him. And, and again, the last two times he's played here, he has lost five and a half strokes around the green. But in those two years, he still finished third and eighth. So it's kind of going back and forth um, with Victor here. And then I think we have to, at least for me, I have to wrap it up with Sungjae. Um Ranks in the top 20 of almost every model category that I, I put out there. Um, just so consistent. And, and let's well, let's be frank here. He's due for a win. You know, I think between him and Justin Thomas, those two are the guys who, you know, they haven't won in a long time. And um, I like Sungjae a lot at uh, 9,100. Yeah, but I think Sungjae, if, if we're being very frank, to use your own words there, is trending towards a win a lot harder than Justin Thomas is. Like Justin Thomas's game is going – in the opposite direction compared to Sungjae, you know, so I don't, I don't necessarily, you know, we'll get to JT in the next range, but I have Sungjae as my fourth ranked golfer this week, Ron. And like you mentioned, I was trying to figure out what exactly about his game is getting him there. There's nothing in particular. It's just everything. He's just, he checks all the boxes, just like you said. And I mean, we got, we got him at 9,100 bucks in, in the mid teens. So Sign us up. Let's agree on that one. I love Sanjay this week. I don't think you can go wrong there. I think the safety is there. We'll see what he can get up to. You know, the people always mention, you know, the lack of upside. I've been one of those advocates too. On hard golf courses, he grades out really well too. I think it's because of his well-rounded game. So let's see what he can get up to. I, I really like his price. I love, you know, what he can get up to this week. Um, and just to touch back some base on Max Homer there. I mean, if he, if he can get the driver working, which used to be one of his strengths, it's kind of gone south recently. And I think you need it to be functioning around this venue. I've been a big, you know, advocate of Max and, and it just hasn't necessarily shown up. He's cost me a lot of money the last three or four events he's played in, um, especially in the Rainmaker world. I had too many of him and he just he's just not being there. You know, can't miss that many amount of cuts. Are we going to just not talk about Jason Day either, Ron? I mean, he's the quail king, essentially, or the queen. Let's call him the quail queen outside of Rory. Um, too much to like about him, yeah. And he's kind of, I think he had a really bad Masters Sunday or weekend. He was right up there in the, inside the top 10 around about lunchtime on Saturday and then just fell off the planet. So with his injury concerns and things like that, you can easily expect him to maybe have been over – overdone a little bit maybe going into there he hasn't played at all since the masters and i think um he'll be back ready to rock and roll a really nice course and the, the key word they're being back yeah i think people have a bad at least me personally just i had him in so many lineups and just to see him collapse like it was I don't, it was some absurd number like he was six over through three holes like he just literally nice. fell apart and so you know Ownership looks, at least from my end, like it's still kind of in that mid-range, 14 15%. So, you know, I think ownership in general this week is just going to be so spread out. Um, you know, uh, so it's just kind of different ways we look at it with, you know, me always being a little more chalky. Um, so, yeah, Day's kind of, again, a guy that I'm going to play, but probably right at the field average just to make sure I get, you know, a piece of him. Um, but, yeah, he's a, he's an interesting question down there right at the 9K mark. Yeah. I think he's real nice and safe play. You know, if you just take away, literally, I think people are overreacting to maybe, uh, you know, 27 holes worth of golf, which at the end of that long streak of, you know, you know, fatigue, I think that's definitely playing a factor. So we'll see what cooks uh, had to mention him before we got out of here into the 8K range now where we've got another chalk bomb. And I've mentioned him once or twice already. And look at that handsome beard on that man. Cameron Young sitting at 8,700 bucks. Looking at 
27% ownership right now, potentially, you know, between him, Victor and Rory, like I mentioned earlier, ownership's going to be through the roof with these three guys. Cam Young, though, to me, seems warranted. I, The only flaw in his game is around the greens, and it's not even like Victor bad. You know, it's just bad um, or not close to average enough, I'd say. But the rest of his game, run Distance off the tee is third behind Rory and Cam Champ. Off the tee on par, um, course of 7,400 yards or more, he leads the field in strokes gained off the tee. When you're looking at strokes gained approach from far away, the guy's a freak. You know, he hits it so high. I think that's also something when you're mentioning how hard it is to retain your ball on these greens. Apex, you know, shot apex. I think that's why Rory plays so well, why Jay Day plays so well. They hit it really high, and Cameron Young does too. Um, just incredible stuff. I think the the putting blemishes that we've seen from inside five feet have pretty much, you know, been eliminated since Paul tesori has been on the bag, you know, pretty much since the players. There's a lot to like about him. The price tag is really affordable for what he's going to offer you. I've got him graded out really well on the model. You know, um, I'll, I'll throw you the, the Cameron Young bone first, and then we can get to everybody else. So... Cameron Young, I think, is kind of the epitome of good chalk. Like, I don't care if he was 40%. I'm kind of probably sound like I'm in the same boat with you. Like, I'm playing him just because he's the ultimate course fit. Like, every single narrative you can come up with, he kind of checks the box. You know, he's local. He went to school at Wake Forest. Um, and you made a great point there with, you know, the more distance you have off the tee here at this course, of course, the greens are known for being very firm, very bouncy. They repel shots. And so... Obviously, the more distance you have, the closer your approach shot's going to be, which means you can take a lower, I'm sorry, a higher lofted iron into those greens. And so, yeah, these guys who hit it farther, who, you know, are going to have that advantage of hitting kind of higher shots, landing softer. Um, we got a lot of tricky pin positions here at Quail Hollow. And so, you know, I just think when you look at that combination again, just like Rory, you know, distance and proximity, you know, he's the second best player in this field. He's gained on approach in six of his last eight. And of course, Paul Tesori, who kind of the X factor here, you know, with Webb Simpson for so many years, you know, he lives here. He knows quail better than just about any caddy out there. And so you throw that into the mix. And, you know, I dare I say at 8,700, it's it's almost like he's a free square. You know, I know people throw that term around a lot, but, yeah. you know, I, I don't see how you cannot have him in your lineup um, a lot this week and, and just try to get different elsewhere. Um, so that that's my take on Cam Young. Yeah. And I think, you know, I look, I can see a, a hundreds of thousands of people going, oh, Rory McIlroy, Cam Young, bang. You know, that's how they're going to start their lineup, sitting at 60% ownership to start off. You know, then you're going to have to get real weird from then on out. Um, that's why I'm kind of fading the Rory aspect here. But, you know, like we said, the, as close to a free square as you can get, God willing, you know, like we'll see what happens. But and and that's the thing is like if it goes wrong it goes wrong it happens you know we've had lots of chalk go wrong someone in the, one of victor rory or cam young are going to be inside the top 5 by the end of the week most likely you know if you if you ran the simulation a thousand times you know that would probably be a high probability so we'll go with that ricky fowler justin thomas ahead of like how's ricky fowler ahead of priced ahead of cameron young you know and justin thomas so Two interesting characters up there. We've got some Sam Burns at 86 underneath him. Terrell Hatton, who I really like this week, and Tom Kim, along with some Sahith the Gala, 8200 bucks. Shane Lowry, Tommy Fleetwood, and Brian Harmon rounding out the bottom at 8K flat. Like I said, Terrell Hatton, Tom Kim, and um, some Sahith and Tommy Fleetwood. I'll be peppering this 8K range a lot. I really like these guys in here. Um, you know, it, it allows you to do that balance build type situation because these are all dudes that you can easily find inside the top 10 by the end of the week. And they all, you know, sub 9K. So that's some nice, some nice value you're finding in these names outside of, I'll be not, I'll be fading Ricky and, and Justin for sure. Cause I think they're going to be both be very popular too. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on Fowler. Um, you know, I think he has this reputation of, you know, He's always on TV commercials. Everybody knows who he is. And so very popular. And yes, his game is just has had gone through a remarkable improvement. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, here we are, elevated field, you know, strong competition. Um, you know, just the guys he's surrounded with, um, you know, on that, you know, 
kind of in that salary tier, you know, with JT right above him, Cameron Young right below him. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, if if people come off him or not. But yeah, I'm not. He's he's one of my fades um, for that reason. Just you know, I want to see him actually win first. I want to see him in contention on a Sunday before I'm going to play him. So he's a guy I'm, I'm 100% fading this week. Um, and, and I'll just say this about JT. I know you're very anti Justin Thomas, um, but again, I think just going back to him winning here in 2017. His ball striking is intact. Okay. He's gained at least two and a half strokes on approach in four of his last five. His off the tee game is not bad. Okay. It's not as good as it has been. Um, he's one of the best around the green players in the world. And, and for a lot of these guys, you know, whether we're talking Luke List, Emiliano Grillo, it, it comes down to putting. And so, you know, I like to bring this up sometimes. You know, he's he's going to be so motivated. He's a ticked off golfer. He's desperate to win. Now, is that going to translate to his play on the course? Probably not. Okay. But, you know, I think he is going to be super focused this week. Um, and at 8,900, you know, it's not like he's 9,600. So for me, um, I'm going to have some Thomas. Um, I think there's a chance he can win this week. And uh, if not win, a high finish. And so I, I don't want to miss out on that because when you when you put him in a lineup, you can fit so many other guys around him at that price. And so I'll go to Sam Burns here. I think he's a guy who's very forgotten, like 9%. I mean, this guy has won five times in the last two years. Um, you know, he's just a guy who fits this course, you know, with his distance, with his length, with his par five scoring, um, the second best putter in the entire field. So that's the thing I love about Burns is even if his ball striking is off a little bit, he can kind of rebound on the greens with the putter. And I think that's what makes him so dangerous. And so another guy who I think is just should be priced a little bit higher than where he is. Um, and then as we get lower here, kind of this, you know, when you go from Terrell Hatton down to Brian Harmon at, at 8K, it's to me, this is almost like a dead range. Like it's like these guys, especially these European guys, Lowry and Fleetwood are, are in this range every single event, it seems like. And it's, you know, they're decent plays. They'll finish top 20, top 30, but it's like, you know, they're not going to be in contention really. So it's just like, who do you play here? And so for me, I think Tom Kim sitting there at 8,400, you know, if you're not going to play a bomber here, which of course we've talked about bombers have a definite advantage you have to be really good with your irons and you have to be really good putting. And so I think he does both of those other two things well. And I don't know what you got him at, but I'm looking at 4% right now. I got him at 10, but this is from yesterday. Okay. So let's, let's go with seven, you know, like that's still very respectable, you know, I and think again, this, appetizing. yeah. And, and people may not remember this, which they should, cause it just happened. But again, he was, you know, he saw this course at the president's cup yeah. You know, I think he was two and three or something like that in, in his matches. But nonetheless, you know, he's got an idea of what it takes to win here. And so at 8,400, again, you don't need him to win. You know, give me a top 20. And, and you know, I think that's good enough. And um, at that ownership, I'll take that. And last last guy I'll talk about here is, is uh, Sahith. Um, you know, when you – he kind of has this reputation. Now, it's, it's kind of going away. But as this kind of volatile guy who, you know, has this upside, but he's got such a low floor – you know, when, when you look at his game log or his event log, he's made 13 cuts in a row. And, you know, fifth at the RBC Heritage, he was ninth at the Masters. Um, so he's turned a corner, and I think his ownership is also coming in kind of low here, yeah. um, around 11 12%. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I just think you have to trust. You know, he's a guy who's seeing these courses for the first time. And so he he's had success. He's a smart guy. He's got all the tools. And so 8,200. I think the upside he presents here kind of far outweighs what you're going to get from a Shane Lowry or, or a Tommy Fleetwood. Yes, I agree. I think the upside Sahith provides you, although I don't necessarily think the course like really fits his game, but I've said that about RBC Heritage. You know, like he's he's had four top tens in his last nine starts, which is you what is going on with Sahith? You know, he's just becoming so solid. Well, let me count to you with this real quick, okay? So okay. this is a long course, right? Yes. Long course, tough course. So listen to this. He finished ninth at Augusta, 14th at Bay Hill, which is one of the closest comps you're going to get to this course. He was sixth at the Genesis, okay, Riviera, very similar course. How about this? Torrey Pines finished fourth at the Farmers. So all long courses, 
Okay, very similar to, to uh, Quail Hollow, very tough. And so just looking at those numbers kind of helped me to turn the corner on him mentally and say, this is a guy I need to play this week. Bang. So those four top tens were all on those courses, most likely. So love to see that from the man. And he's he's finding himself. He's, you know, like when he's one of the best wedge players, too, in the world. So I'm going to be really on this dude when we get to some birdie fists in the middle of the summer. Yeah. I think that's something to look forward to, too, for him. And I think between him and Cam Young, one of these two guys has to win a tournament this year. Like, it has to happen, you know. Like, And I think Sahith is potentially got as good a shot as Cam Young to do that. You know, the way he just – he can just go nuclear and just shoot eight under par on a Sunday and win, win like five or six pairings ahead of everybody, which I think is how he's been getting all these top tens, unfortunately. But he's never really been in the mix in the mix. But he's still, you know, no, DFS points are DFS points. doesn't matter how he gets there. So we'll see how that goes. I really like Seth too this week. Um, really, really like him. Tommy and Shane, a little more more safe, you know, like just, you know, ARRP type situations. But we'll move on down to the 7K range and, and find some gems for us here, Ron. Um, I'll go right off the bat and say Matt Kucha is somebody I'll be looking to play as well. Does not fit the course fit whatsoever. But when you're looking at needing to just make par as a good score on the majority of every single hole you're playing, looking at bogey avoidance, if I take a peek at what Matt Kucha gets up to on the bogey avoidance front and the par five scoring, bogey avoidance, fifth, par five scoring, 28th. So a lot to like from him there in that department. There's obviously major concerns with the long irons and things, but he can scramble his face off and absolutely just, you know, Bore this course to death. I think he'll get up and down a lot. He's sitting at sub 5% ownership, which is something I'm looking forward to. Some other guys that I'll be kind of trying to dodge the chalk here in the 7K range, which I think there's, you know, Wyndham Clark, Keegan Bradley, Keith Mitchell. I'll be playing some Keegan Bradley for sure. Um, I don't know about Keith Mitchell that much. You know, I don't really like what his irons have been up to lately, you know, especially if he's going to be 14, 15%. Taylor Montgomery is someone I'm going to be going to. I don't know why. I just feel like he's length off the tee here the and the short game. You know, the approach the approach stuff's not so hot. It is what it is. But he, I feel like he's a better long iron player than he is a short, you know, like a wedge guy, especially with that length. And then, you know, the around the green play is just fantastic. I think he's going to score you a lot of points in, in DFS too, even at a difficult course like this. So are there any guys that you kind of, taking a peek at in the top of the 7K range that you kind of want to get my attention towards? I think Corey Connors um, is kind of perpetually, when you when he gets in these kind of strong fields, is always in that kind of that top 7K, low 8K range. And so here you have again, 7,900. He's not a bomber, but he consistently ranks high in total driving. Yeah. Um, he consistently gains on longer courses, which I think is another thing to, to keep in mind. This week uh, plays great at Augusta, which again is another course that race kind of similar to Quail Hollow here. Of course, TBC San Antonio, where he's got both of his wins. You have to be really good off the tee there. That's a tough course. Um, so again, I think he's going to be full of confidence. Of course, he did not have the best President's Cup um, in uh, 2022 here. Um, and so I think just him winning recently is going to kind of help really with his confidence coming into this week. Um, again, he's been successful at a course like Bay Hill. So I, I really like Connors this week. I think Wendell Clark, um, I think people are used to playing him kind of in the weaker events. And now here we go to a, a big field, strong competition. And, you know, when you look at the numbers, he's playing the highest above his baseline than any other player in this field. Like he's really turned it on to another level. Even last week, you know, I remember waking up and looking at he was like four under through 10 holes. Um, in that first round. And, you know, I was kind of in shock because like everybody thought that was a perfect course for him. And, and look what he did on the weekend. Like he rebounded to finish. I think he finished 10 under. Um, so I just think that's, that's a good sign that he can have a bad round and he can bounce back so quickly. Of course, he has all the kind of fit here as well off the tee, streaky putter, really good around the greens. Um, and so I really love him. Keith Mitchell though, to me is kind of, kind of related to almost, almost like a little mini Cameron Young. Um, I think this is a perfect Mitchell course. He's the lead off the tee. Of course, kind of the evidence is right there. You know, he finished third here in 2021. Um, his last trip uh, before then, he finished eighth. He leads the tour in total driving. Again, balancing kind of distance and accuracy. So 
I think Mitchell is a great play. Um, kind of lower owned right now, 11%. So I'm liking that. And then, you know, you, you keep going down the list here. Gary Woodland, you know, of course, he's been so horrible putting. But again, this course. So again, if you think about this and I kind of boil it down here, the tougher the course, the fewer the putts that are going to be made by everyone. Okay. So there's not going to be a putting contest. So, yeah. you know, Woodland is used to, you know, he has that veteran presence. He's played on these tough courses so many times. His ball striking has just been through the roof spectacular. So if he can just kind of hang in there, you know, I think making the cut and just kind of hopefully um, using that veteran presence over the weekend. Um, you know, I do like Woodland. And then Patrick Rogers, another guy who had a great weekend in Mexico. Uh, he gained eight and a half strokes ball striking from Friday, or I'm sorry, eight and a half total he gained from Friday through Sunday. Another guy who fits the profile here, long off the tee. Um, the, the good thing for me that I'm really liking about Rogers is over his last 12 rounds, he's 15th in this entire field in approach. Um, he's gained 10.2 strokes on approach in his last three events, three straight top twenties. Um, and again, he finished uh, a lot of people don't remember this, but back in 2015, he was runner up to uh, McElroy when, when Rory won that year. So um, those would be my, my guys in kind of the upper seven K range. Yeah. I, I love Rogers. You know, I think at this price tag, that's fine. You know, I don't think he's ever going to win a tournament ever. I don't think he's capable of closing out an event, but at 7,500 bucks, you just need him to finish inside the top 10. Regardless if he's leading going into Sunday or not, I think he'll be just fine. Um, someone I also do want to mention, Ron, is Taylor Moore. Um, very good long iron player. You know, nice off the tee. And he's kind of like, you know, a little knockoff version of Gary Wooden on the ball striking front, but a much better short game. You know, so that's what you want to see from, from somebody like that. And I think he'll be a decent pivot off of Woodland. I think Woodland's going to be very popular again this week. And, you know, I want to get off of him. Pro probably go to Taylor Moore and Taylor Montgomery. I'll just do the – looks like Woodland's in a Taylor sandwich over there in the $7,600 range. So, we'll see what he can get up to. I don't mind him. Davis Riley and Nick Hardy have both got my attention. I think, you know, you never know what happens to these guys, even after just winning a a team event. Anything can happen. And, and sometimes it just – these guys are so supremely talented. All it takes is a bit of confidence in order to – kind of get them to the next level and knowing that you've got your tour card for the next two years now knowing that you you're capable of winning a tournament be it with another partner you know like you know you've got that capability of doing it you never know what these guys can get up to going from there um, I think we saw it with Davis Riley last year where he kind of played well in the team event and then really went on you know to almost win the Valspar or whatever so um, I don't know if I'm doing it backwards or not but you know you get what my point my point is yeah so I like those two guys. I also was on them, so I'm kind of like a little sentimental. Um, I'll be I'll be playing Hayden Buckley as well and Adam Hadwin and Emiliano Grillo. I think I love all three of those guys, along with Davis Riley. There's there's some really good value here in in the seven K range before you start getting off into the, the the sixes. And then one other guy I want to mention, two actually, is Kurt Kiriyama. If you kind of Rattle off Sir Hith the Gala's track record. I feel like Kurt fits the bill perfectly. Think about Bayhill. Think about Vedanta. Think about, you know, I think he's played nicely at those two venues before. You can really see him playing well here. Yeah, he's a really good long iron player. Got some great distance off the tee. And his short game can can get hot. So, like that. Sam Ryder as well. And then JT Poston actually grades out really nicely for me. He's a really good long iron player. And he dominates par fives. There's only three of them on this course. But, you know, you can essentially convert a few par fours into par fives, basically, because it's a long-ass course. And the same skill set you need to dominate par fives, you need for long par fours. JT Poston can do that. So, you know, just because there's only three par fives on this course doesn't necessarily mean there's only three par fives on this course. You know, there's some long par fours out there, which can technically be classified as par fives. So those are some guys I'm kind of eyeing out in the 7K range. You want to... Rattle off a few guys you got in mind towards the bottom yet, Ron? Yeah, I'll quickly go through a couple. Um, so yeah, I agree with Kitayama. Like, and he's proven he's proven he can do it at an elevated event. You know, of course yeah. he won um, a few weeks ago. So, but Hayden Buckley, you know, elite driver, he hasn't lost off the tee in over a year. You know, consecutive top ten. So who knows? Maybe Buckley has kind of turned the corner. Um, and I think Quail should kind of magnify his strengths, which again, off the tee 
is, is the main part of that. I think if you're looking for safety down here, like if you have five good guys and you're just looking for a, someone who's going to make the cut, like you can't go wrong with Adam Scott, uh, 7,300. And again, I think Scott has that upside as well, just because of this is a longer course. This does, you know, these tougher scoring courses kind of fit him perfectly. And so I really like Adam Scott at 7,300 this week. You know, he's he's kind of been kind of wandering in the wilderness, you know, just kind of aimlessly, you know, T30, T40, just kind of not doing anything. And everybody else is having all this success around him. So, you know, if I were him, I would be, you know, really motivated to, to kind of turn that corner and, and have some maybe a top 10 here. So that's what I'm banking on this week, at least. Um, but going down here, kind of near the bottom of this range, I think there's some really interesting guys. Uh, Benny on has gained putting like I couldn't believe it, like six of his last seven events. He's been positive with the putter. Another guy who has distance off the tee, ball striking, I think. Really good think, around the greens. Yes, I think he should be much higher priced than what he is, mm -hmm. just based on how he's been playing recently. Um, you want to go lower here to Matt Wallace, who had a horrible miscut in Mexico. I mean, I had him. I don't know how many lineups I had him in, but he just kind of fell apart on Friday. Um, but again, another guy who's can be wild off the tee, but again, the rough here is not that penal. Um, and so I think it fits him, kind of that old European tough – um, kind of tough, long course. I think he fits perfectly. Taylor Pendrith is another, another guy here at 7K mm -hmm. flat that, you know, playing a little bit better recently, but I'll be playing him just strictly course fit. You know, Bomber off the tee, yeah. can get hot with the putter. Um, you know, Adam Shank kind of fits that as well. Um, and so those are those are the guys I'm, I'm focusing on. And, and I, don't, I don't not understand the Sam Stevens love at 10%. Like, he's at 7K. I've seen so many people on him. Like, I think one elevated event he's been in and he did do uh, pretty well at, I can't remember which one it was, but I want to see this guy a lot more before I start playing him before, you know, a Taylor Pendrith. Mm -hmm. And two things, Taylor Pendrith was pretty much chosen for the president's cup team because of his skill set for this golf course. And Adam Scott has played in his last seven starts, made all seven cuts finished inside the top 40 for Adam Scott in 77% of them, no top 20s, no top 10s. So he's just like the ultimate safety play. Like you, you know, the upside is just ultra limited. But again, at this price tag, it is what it is. You know, you're going to just get that. And I think that's fine. You know, if you're going to want to make sure you get six for sixes through, we're ready to rock and roll with Adam Scott. So I think that's nice and safe. And then just looking at the cuts made, Justin Sir has made 100% of his cuts in the nine starts he's played so far. Um, in 2023. So Justin says a, a safety play there too. Let's dive into the sixes. Some dumpster diving. There's not too many guys that you most likely want to play in this area. Um, you're going to be taking some, some risks, obviously. That's why they price in this price range. I don't see too many guys that are ranked anywhere near the top 30 in my, my model over here. Some people that are. Luke List at $6,900. I think if we go to the Farmers... I think it's a great comp course, right? Um, you take the putting out of play, massive distance off the tee, you know, really impressive with the long irons. I like Luke List at 6,900 bucks. Um, and then Will Gordon, kind of basically the same same kind of blueprint as, as Luke List, um, a bit better of an iron player, and he's also 6,900 bucks. So I'll jump it over to you while I kind of re reestablish who I'm going to be speaking about before I rattle off some names that I don't necessarily even care about. but. Um, who do you have in the sixty nine hundred dollars in the six K range? Right? So list list is just one of those guys where you know you look at last week. I, I played him last week, Mexico, very similar course. And my my thing with list is if he if he couldn't even make the cut last week in that weak field where it's just wide open and it's kind of fit his skill set perfectly, and the greens were so much easier, like should I trust him here? So again, at sixty nine hundred, you know, I'm sure he's worth kind of fitting in the last, you know, a few lineups here. Um, but that's kind of the, kind of my thought process was, is with him. You know, he's just been so bad recently. Um, I do like Joseph Bramlett. I think, I think Bramlett's an up and coming star um, approach game bomber off the tee. 
and very similar to list, you know, he's got another one of those guys who just struggles on the greens. And so, you know, if he can, and he's proven this when he can just stay neutral or slightly negative, like he has been like last week, he lost, I think 0.7 on the greens, you know, top 15 finish, you know, he's just got the length to compete here. And I would not be surprised if he finishes, uh, you know, top 20 again this week. And you have Will Gordon right there next to them, 6,900, another bomber who um, played really well um, Thursday through Saturday last week, kind of fell apart on Sunday. Um, but he's another guy who, again, we're getting into this range where we don't have a lot of course history to go on here. So what's the next thing you should turn to is course fit. Who fits the course? And, you know, I think Bramlin and Gordon fit it perfectly. Um, I think as you go down here, Eric Cole, who didn't seem like he fit Mexico because he's not a long hitter off the tee. You know, he comes in top five finish. Um, I think you should not sleep on him at 6,800. Um, he's kind of proven that he can step up his game when it matters. And a similar guy, you have Dylan Wu, 6,700. Like you see him on TV, this, this, this short, skinny kid uh, with what he looks like. And, and he just is rattling off top 15 after top 20. And it's just you know, not getting really much respect here um, from the pricing at 6,700. But, you know, I think he's proven that he can play on any type of course. And so I love him at 6,700. I think Eric Von Royen, we, we again saw him, another guy who similar to Gordon kind of fell apart on Sunday, but he has always historically played well when the fields are tougher. Um, so 1% ownership right now. I think he's playing well minus that bad round on Sunday. Um, MJ Duffy, another guy who kind of elevates his game on tough courses. Of course, he missed the cut last week. Um, and then the last guy I'll mention here um, is my guy, Alejandro Tosti. Um, I think at 6,500, kind of the same, I think the same exact price he was last week. Um, and again, a guy who hits it far off the tee. Um, and so I think at 6,500 at that price, um, you could do a lot worse than him. Absolutely. I like, and I think... In this range, you're kind of honing in on a few e elite-ish skill sets that he's not elite, very good skill sets that these guys have. Eric Van Royen, 10th from 150 to 200 yards in strokes gained from the fairway. 20th from 150 plus out of the rough. So you love that from him. MJ Duffy, really good putter, length of the tee, and he's been putting together some really consistent rounds. I think this was his worst tournament in the last four events, having... He lost like three and a half strokes putting, which he doesn't do regularly. It's his worst putting performance of the season. So I think he'll bounce back from that. Michael Kim, really good from 200 plus. Love what he can get up to. He's been playing some solid golf. He's been making about two thirds of his cuts recently. And then another guy that kind of you can hope for a little bit. I have an outright on him at 400 to one is Cam Champ. If you think about yeah, 400 to one Cam Champ, let's go. Uh, putting. It can get hot every now and then, and he's got massive. He's the second longest guy behind Rory in the field, and he's the seventeenth best from two hundred plus out. Which and he looked good out. last week. Exactly. So you know, like he's he's very bad from wedge range, which is one of the least you know seen areas of golf on this golf course. So. Like three quarters of your shots are coming from 150 plus, like you mentioned, 54% from 175. And the further away you get from the hole for Cam Champ, the better. He's just a really, really good long iron player. I like him at 6,600 bucks. And then um, someone <laughs> mentioned in a chat that I was in the other day, Jimmy Walker. Jimmy Walker is a really random play, but he's really good out of the rough, Ron. Because like we've mentioned, there's going to be, what are you hitting about half the fairways here this week? Mm -hmm. So if you can get a Jimmy Walker that's 25th out of the rough from 150 and out, sign me up. So those are some guys I'm kind of leaning on. We'll see what we can get up to. Um, care to share your favorite sub, sub seven and a half K guy, and then your favorite above that. Um, Sub seven and a half. Um, I will probably go with uh, Ben on. Um, so at 7,100 and if I'm going up, like obviously Cam Young is the easy answer, yeah. uh, but if I'm, I'm choosing someone a little different here, I'm going to go Keith Mitchell, 7,800 would be my other choice up here. Cool. Keith Mitchell. Interesting. Interesting. Yep. I'm going to go with, for my top dude, 
9,100 bucks, Sung Im, if I'm not picking Cam Young. And then for 70 something something, I'm going to go with, man, I'm going to go with Kurt Kutayama at 7,200 bucks. I think he tends to show up in these, these big events, you know, the seat. Oh, another, another comp course is Congaree. You know, yep. and he played well there too. So love what he can get up to on these long golf courses and in the big events. You know, he's not scared to 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 show up on the top of the leaderboard there, obviously winning the Bay. So cool. I'm glad um Daigle could join us today. We'll have to give him some trouble for that. Um obviously football's more important than golf, but I'm just giving him some trouble. We are all very busy trying to make a living in this wonderful world that is content creation. Ron, what's going on for the rest of the week? What what can people find from you? So we have um, a kind of an office hours uh, on our subscriber Discord coming up at 4.30 Eastern, where if you have any DFS questions, any betting questions, um, it'll be me, Ryan Noonan, and Andy Molitor will be on. So um, anybody who's a subscriber, and again, you are encouraged to subscribe so you can get in that Discord mm -hmm. um, and get in there and kind of pick our brains on some of our favorite plays for the week. So that's the main thing we got coming up, and I uh, got a – other things we posted on the Discord, first round leader bets. Um, we're we're struggling there, but uh, hopefully we'll we'll hit one this week. So, absolutely, yeah. First round leader bets, man. I've given up hope on that. I hit five of them last year and didn't even double my money because it. I I had dead heat rules in all of them, so it was just a disaster. So, props to the people that do it. I've just stopped betting that nonsense. Um, if you want to find me, catch me at the Model Maniac on Twitter. I've got all my work out there for Rotoball and Jazz and Back Nine Bets, all that jazz too. Um, Ron, thank you so much for another fun episode. Just you and me, the Byron Show. And um, yeah, till next week, we've got the Byron Nelson, where we will be back for that. I actually know what course is coming up the following week, which is a first time, I think, on this show. So till next time, folks, we'll catch